Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome everyone to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. My name is Jason Romano. Great to have you on the program today. As always, you can download and subscribe to this podcast on Apple, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, everywhere podcasts are found. And of course, you can find all of our podcasts, all of our content at sportspectrum.com, where you can become a subscriber, you can become a partner, you can become a member of the Sports Spectrum family for just $36 for an entire year. $36, and that gets you our magazine subscription, four magazines, as well as all of our content, access to 30 years of content in the Sports Spectrum library, all for just $36. So go to sportspectrum.com, check that out. Great idea for a Christmas present. Great idea to give to uh, maybe your grandson or your son or your granddaughter or your daughter, uh, youth pastor, whatever it is. It's a great idea, I think, that can minister to a lot of different people and some of the great content that we're putting together here at Sports Spectrum and at SportsSpectrum.com. Today's guest, he is a former NFL quarterback. His name is Dan Orlovsky, and Dan was a fifth-round draft pick by the Detroit Lions back in 2005. He played seven seasons in the Motor City. He also had stints in Houston with the Texans, one year with Indianapolis and the Colts, and he also played in Tampa with the Buccaneers, and he was with the Rams this past training camp in August in Los Angeles before he was cut just before the season started. And he was a stud quarterback in college at the University of Connecticut in Storrs, Connecticut, setting numerous passing records, and many of them that still stand today. And he recently retired from the NFL in October of 2017. Longtime backup quarterback, so we have a good conversation about that kind of journey for him and going from wanting to be a starter to accepting his role as a backup and as a mentor. We also talk about Dan's faith, his faith in Christ, and the story that he shares of how he came to know the Lord through the locker room in Detroit with the Lions and guys like John Kitna and guys like Josh McCown who helped really plant seeds and mentor him and point him towards the Lord. So really great story there. Excited for you to hear this conversation. Without further ado, here he is, former NFL quarterback, longtime NFL quarterback, 12 seasons of professional football in the NFL. He is Dan Orlovsky. Dan, welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. How are you? I'm good, Jason. Appreciate you having me, man. It is great to talk to you. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while now, and this seems more uh, adept to being the perfect time to talk to you now because it was October of 2017, just a few months ago, a few weeks ago, that you wrote a piece for us on SportsSpectrum.com announcing your retirement from the NFL after 12 seasons, and it's been a, a few weeks now since that announcement. How's life treating you? Now that you're officially a former NFL quarterback. Yeah, you know, it's been good. It's been good. It's been a good transition. Um, it's a transition that you necessarily aren't prepared for and not um, educated on how to handle it. But it's been a, it's been a fun experience to ch- be challenged, to reinvent yourself, figure out what's next, see what you want to get good at, um, find something that you could be passionate about that, is different than being a football player, but also just having some time to peel back and and do some things I've never done before. I've never had a fall to myself. I've never had, I was telling a buddy yesterday, I've never had Thanksgiving without Hmm. football or football practice since I was like 13 years old. So um, it's, it's been a good, good transition. What do you miss most? What do you miss most about playing? Oh, geez, everything. (laughs) Um, You know, I was, uh, I was, when you get to a point where you play for a long time, you start to appreciate the little things that you don't as a younger player, the, the individualized friendships that you had, that you had going to work every single day with people that you truly appreciated admired and genuinely cared for and loved. So I I miss those friendships. I miss those relationships. I miss being in the locker room. I was a big guy, just loved being in the locker room because the locker room is full of so many different kinds of so many different kinds of people, guys, different colors and different races and different beliefs and different backgrounds and different goals. And uh, it's such a, a melting pot of people that I really enjoyed getting to know everybody and being part of the group and 
the competition, obviously, and, and the adrenaline that comes from so many things about it, but just um, being around people that, you know, we're like you, but we're also extremely different than you and, and somehow getting on the same page with a lot of stuff. I miss those relationships. We're going to talk more about your career, especially your NFL career in a little bit, but I want to go back. Let's start with, you know, back when you were a teenager, you said 13 was the last time that you probably spent a Thanksgiving at home with your family and didn't have a practice or a game. So let's talk about that time, your teen years and where football began to become a big part of your life. Take us there and where football kind of was in your in your life back then. Yeah, I started playing football when I was about eight years old and flag football. And and um, I was the kid who could throw it pretty good. So I played quarterback naturally from day one. And then as I got a little bit older, football became a little bit more real to me. As a teenager, I, I went to play tackle football in, in Connecticut. I, it's called Pop Warner. So I was playing tackle football. And the town that I grew up in, Shelton, Connecticut, has a really rich history of a sports town. So it was a big deal. I mean, sports, especially football in the town I grew up in, is is, um, is highly thought of. Football for me was um, – it was, it was the love of my childhood for sure. You know, I played basketball and I played baseball, but nothing, nothing – matched what football gave me and and how much I loved it and uh, I was it was an easy game for me to play because I just loved being playing quarterback I loved the moment I loved being the center of attention um, and and I just um, you know football was very much you know the defining aspect of my childhood you said you played other sports but football was always you know that one sport so as you started to get better in high school and certainly winning state championships and being one of the best players in the state are you finding yourself dedicating all of your time to perfecting your craft or are you still as you get into high school kind of mixing it in with other sports no I mean I was pretty pretty full go ahead with football I mean um I started probably going, okay, I'm just going to be a football player back into my sophomore year of high school. I played baseball freshman and sophomore year, um, but was not nearly as good as I was, or hopefully as good as I was in football. And um, there came a time where, you know, recruiting started to get picked up for me in football. And I just was an okay baseball player. So it was one of those things was, you know, one of those situations where it was like, all right, let's make a decision, you know, if this is going to be something that I'm going to put all my eggs into, or if, if I'm, if I'm going to kind of see what else I can do with it. So when you're in high school, there's got to be a moment for you where you said, man, I'm pretty good, you know, and, and forget the humility side for a minute in sports. You just like, okay, this, this thing, this football thing, this is pretty real. This is, this is happening for me. Do you have a moment there, maybe a game early in your high school career, or maybe even later when you were like, man, I'm, I'm pretty good at this game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, I playing quarterback, you don't, most of us at least don't shy away from, you know, confidence and <laughs> uh, thinking how, probably too highly of ourselves. Um, but there is a, you know, probably my senior high school, um, we were, you know, we were playing this team, West Haven high school. They were the number one team in the state. Um, really good athletes, really good players, really good team, historically a really good team. And we went and played them on the road and we started the game off. Our coach had the idea, Hey, let's start the game off in a no huddle. You're just going to call the play at the line of scrimmage. And obviously as a quarterback, I love that. So we went there and first drive of the game, went like seven, eight, nine plays, scored a touchdown right away, ended up winning the game. And I remember being on the bus ride back and thinking to myself, that was probably the, one of the most fun games I've had because the control aspect of it and, you know, beating a team that many people didn't think we would. But that was probably one of those games in my younger years where I said, OK, I got a chance to. I got a chance here to to do something that, you know, is kind of a dream that's inside of my heart. And then recruiting and choosing a college and you choose UConn. And for many people, that's what you're still affiliated with. You think Dan Orlovsky and yeah, you played 12 years in the NFL, but many people still go right to that University of Connecticut. But you had some offers to play at some bigger schools, Purdue, Michigan State, I read, and some others. Why choose UConn, especially when they were at the time, I think, a one double A school? Yeah, I mean, 
truthfully, I wanted to go to a bigger school early on, like, you know, early in my Back into my sophomore year, early in my junior year, when I started my recruiting process, and you're getting letters and from these schools that you see on television all the time or you hear about all the time, and and speak to these coaches, and and I I wanted to go to Boston College. I was the kid that grew up in New England who wanted to go play football at Boston College, and hmm. and um, my father wanted me to go play football into the Big Ten, and and so did I. And then I took a couple visits, and uh, you know, UConn and Coach Edsel had recruited me consistently from my sophomore year on really. And, um, I didn't really pay them much attention. Not, it was it, in retrospect, as I look back, I was probably a little bit of a disrespectful handling by me, but it was just, I didn't even pay attention to UConn because there was other schools and I thought bigger and better. And I took a couple visits, um, and actually committed to Michigan state and then they had a kid who was playing as a true freshman who was playing really well when I was a senior in college. And so it was like, I don't want to go there because he's a true freshman playing. And then I took a visit to Purdue and I was going to call Purdue and commit. And the morning of that day uh, on the internet, it was reported that Kyle Orton had committed to Purdue and Kyle mm-hmm. and I had crossed paths in high school. He played in the NFL for a dozen years. And so, um, I was like, well, I'm not going to go to there because I know how good Kyle is. And it wasn't like a, a scared of competition thing. I just really wanted to play early. And then I took a visit to the University of Virginia. And uh, a good friend of mine right now, Matt Schaub, was actually my host. And um, really loved Virginia. But the head coach kept calling me Matt, not Dan. So <laughs> uh, I was like, well, I'm not going to go there because the coach doesn't even know, really know my name. And so I remember – landing on my flight from Virginia from my visit and calling my father and saying, Hey, I'm going to commit to UConn, you know, cause it was just <clears throat> one of those things as time went on, my experiences with other, you know, institutions and, and coaches went on. I realized what coach Edson was trying to do at Connecticut and kind of how I fell in love with his vision. And, um, you know, I ended up calling coach and committing and it was a, a bump, bumpy couple of weeks in my home because my father wasn't too pleased with the decision, um, but obviously I, I look back and, and uh, couldn't have made a better one. How difficult is that to go through that recruiting process? And you know your father's there. I know he was influential in your life for sure. And and yet you make a choice that at first he wasn't completely on board with. How difficult was that? It was hard. It was real hard. I, I think that, um, you know, as I look back now and I have sons of my own, and I don't know how my father did it, but I did. I, I do believe, you know, I was always a kid who knew what I wanted. Um, but I think somehow my father was able to make sure that that was something that I stayed focused on. And I don't think he saw it in that moment, but I knew what I wanted. I knew it was going to um, motivate me. I knew what was going to be the thing that, you know, like it was the vision or the dream in my heart. And I just had to trust that. And so you know, I kept telling him in the moment, you just have to trust that this is the decision that I want to make. And he was like, you're, you know, you're shying away from competition. There's better opportunity. And, and my whole thing was, I wanted to try to do something that everyone thought was crazy and, and almost impossible. That's what got me up in the morning and, and made me tick or make me go was, you know, not, okay, I'm going to go to Purdue or Michigan state and just be another really good player. I wanted to go to UConn and be the best player that ever went there. And so it was difficult, but I trusted that, you know, in my heart, I felt it was the right choice. Well, it definitely turned out to be, as you set school records for most completions, pass attempts, yards passing, touchdown passes, total plays, total yards. And for many people, when they think UConn football, like I said earlier to this day, you're one of the first names, if not the first name that comes to mind. So how do you look back at your time with the Huskies? I know early on you played right away. You were playing from the moment you were a freshman after an injury took place and you were playing as an 18 year old, you know, young kid coming in first year and obviously had a great career. How do you look time? How, how do you look back at your time with the Huskies? Uh, I mean, as, as glowingly as I could have ever hoped for the, just from going there, it was a school that was trying to build up. So, Going there, it wasn't there wasn't this sen- sense of entitlement or arrival. I mean, my freshman year during training camp, we had camp, and you know how the summers are up in you know the New England area. It gets hot and it gets oh, yeah. muggy, 
and we had camp uh, there were, there were days where we had three practices a day and we were in dorm rooms with no air conditioning. So I remember sleeping on the tile ground at night during training camp just to, you know, be able to sleep because it was cool. And so I, that sounds silly, but there's parts of that, that, you know, I appreciate now because I knew how hard the journey was, um, the sacrifices that were made. I wanted to transfer my freshman year because we were not good and, and uh, it was, you know, I had the, well, the grass has got to be greener thing. I can go to one of those schools that I had an offer from. And mm. my father was adamant, no, you gave this coach and this team and your teammates your word. You're not going anywhere. And that was a great learning experience for me to realize how important it was to say something and then do it and um, to be reliable and to be accountable. I had a head coach, Randy Etzel, who preached so many different things that mattered off the field of accountability and reliability and dependability and hard work and sacrifice and doing the right things all the time. And, and those are things that are so easy to say, but so hard to do until you, it became such a routine in my life. And it wasn't a routine in my life because I, I necessarily wanted it. It was instilled in me from the game and from the coaching staff. And then being part of the journey with some of my guys who I'm still buddies with nowadays and kind of doing, you know, what I went there to do, you know, what the dream or the vision was that it was in my heart that I decided to go to UConn to be able to actually go and do it. Just uh, my experience there was incredible. And, and I look back and I wouldn't be where I am or who I am or what I am today without having gone there. And I, I asked, uh, asked a similar question about your high school time, Dan, and now I'm going to ask it for your college time because you end up getting drafted into the NFL, and we'll talk about that in a second. But where's the moment when you say, oh, this is, this is bigger than just maybe playing college football. This NFL thing might be a possibility. When does that moment take place for you? Yeah, I don't think it really happened until probably like my junior year or maybe like the off season before my senior year. Um, you know, I had a okay freshman year and a little bit better of a sophomore year, but still was at UConn and, and, uh, my sophomore year, we were two and six and then ended up getting on a roll and getting to six and six. And so maybe some thoughts of it then. And then my junior year, we had a really good team, a really good offense. We were top five in the country in every kind of offensive st st statistical category, and I just remember generating a little bit more national buzz. We ended up beating some pretty good teams that year. And, and uh, I had some, some good numbers. That was probably, you know, part of a process of me realizing it. But then that off season, um, Mel Kuyper had put me on his like top 25 big board. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the moments where I was like, oh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm kind of viewed at a little bit differently and, and um, and nationally kind of have taken, you know, I, I've gotten some people's attention and some notice. And so that's when it really came into like uh, an idea of, OK, I, I not only can go to the NFL, but I'm going to go to the NFL. And then you get selected by the Detroit Lions, 2005 NFL draft, fifth round. What do you remember about that day? Uh, not 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 good memories of that draft. Uh, you know, Why I is would, that. Well, going into my senior year, you know, I was a little bit, I was highly thought of, you know, in the national, the ranking system, which I understand is a flawed thing, whatever. Um, I ended up having an okay senior year and go into the draft process. And I have the thought process in my mind of, well, I'm probably going to be a first or second round draft pick. And so I'm going through the process and, and pro days and senior bowl, and I don't perform well at those situations. And but I still don't think it's going to affect me that much draft day. And when I was getting drafted, the draft was just a two day event where drafts rounds one, two, and three were on day one. And then four, five, six, seven were on day two. And so day one comes and I'm fully expecting to be drafted in the first day because it's the first three rounds. And, um, I don't get drafted and, and um, the last pick of the third round was a guy by the name of Maurice Claret. I'm oh, sure yeah. sports fans remember. And uh, he carried some baggage in that moment. And so when I saw him get drafted, I was just like, it was a very emotional thing for me because I was, you know, selfish and nearsighted and, 
and I just got, it was a very, um, you know, uh, uh, personal thing where I was just like, wait, I'm not going to, he's going to get drafted and I'm not going to get drafted in the first three rounds. And again, you're a kid and you think where you get drafted is the biggest deal. And, and so the next day comes and, you know, fourth round goes and I don't get drafted. So I'm, I'm not in a good place mentally at that moment. And then I finally get drafted. So it was a, that moment was a big weight off my shoulders and um, certainly a motivational thing, but it didn't go, it didn't go as planned, certainly. Um, and it didn't, you know, bring illicit memories of, you know, this, you know, everything was perfect type of day. But you're still drafted into the NFL. So that's pretty sure. cool. Suddenly you're, you're hooked to a team and the Lions are, you know, who you call yourself as you're a Detroit Lions quarterback and you come there and now you're a rookie and you're, you're certainly backing up, uh, you know, other quarterbacks behind you when you're trying to learn. How big of an, an adjustment was it for you to acclimate yourself to this NFL life? Yeah, it was it was huge. I mean, there's so many variables that go from playing being a college athlete to being a professional athlete. And then there's so many more attached to being a college quarterback to a pro quarterback. You know, you go from. Literally, I went from and I I used I reference this a little bit sometimes nowadays with kids coming up, but I would sleep on a futon in my dorm room and watch movies or play video games till two or three in the morning, and then I had to go be a member of a billion dollar company, and so and I had to grow up really 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 fast, and I was relatively mature leaving college, but from that transition, I go you know I've never lived outside of the state of Connecticut, and then it's boom I'm living in Detroit, Michigan, so there's a lot of things that come along with that transition and learning and meeting new people and shaking hands with guys who are 30 years old and have three kids and you're 21 and going, I literally hope I just don't, you know, ruin this conversation by stuttering over my words. So, um, but also it's this, you get into this moment of, wow, I'm here. I've made it. I'm shaking hands with guys who, you know, are, some of the best players in the NFL and, and I'm, I'm getting this chance to um, I'm getting this chance to live out this childhood dream. And I've got this, I'm going to work at this facility, this complex that has got indoor practice fields and as much Gatorade or protein shakes as I want. And I can go get a massage whenever I want. And I have access to all kinds of technology. So it was like this incredible moment of like, Whoa, I'm here but whoa, I'm finally here. You know what I'm saying? There's two different viewpoints or vantage points to it. So um, I I love the transition, but it was difficult. What about your faith walk? We haven't really talked about that much. This is a sports and faith podcast. So let's talk about your faith walk a little bit. Growing up first, growing to church. Maybe you didn't go to church. What did that look like for you as a kid growing up? Yeah. I mean, I went to your traditional Catholic school my whole life and I went to traditional church my whole life. I was an altar boy. Um, and so faith wise, though, you know, I was the kid that would had to get told, you know, 27 times every Sunday morning, get up, we're going to church. <laughs> and, um, you know, throughout high school, when <clears throat> when things would go well for me, mainly I was a sports kid. So sports were at very much at the, you know, the 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 forefront of my life. So when things would go well, I would you know, occasionally like say like, you know, thank God or praise God or, you know, cool. And when things would go bad, I would go, well, what the heck God, or, you know, what's going on or what did I do? Or why, why isn't thing, why aren't things going my way? And, um, I certainly didn't, you know, have a faith that I was a real thing in my life. You know, God was somebody when things went well, 99 of a hundred times I'd pat myself on the back and maybe another time say like, Hey, cool. Thanks. And then when things would go bad, I'd point fingers type stuff. So, you know, my faith, I don't think it was a faith. I think, you know, when I was a kid, it was more just, a, you know, a tradition or a, you know, a ritual um, that I kind of clung to because not clung to, but that kind of, I did because, you know, truthfully I was, you know, a white suburban kid in America and that's what we did. What about um, uh, college years, even early in the NFL? Is it the same thing? You know, or is faith even on the radar for you as you get older and you start to become this, uh, you know, excellent quarterback, this college, you know, stud, this professional football player? Is faith even in that 
in the in well, the realm for you? Where where are you where is college, it for you there? College certainly not. I think that you know when it came to me with college, like I had this desire to be, I had this desire to be thought of as like a good person and nice and cordial and mannered. So, um, you know, sometimes I would say like, oh, I'm a Catholic or whatever, or, you know, and and that's not set against anybody who is Catholic. That's just you know what my communication was to people, but I, my faith wasn't on the radar at all. I was very much so living by the world, um, in the world way of the world. And, you know, I was trying to soak up the, I'm a starting quarterback for a college football team experience, you know, A to Z. So faith and a relationship with Jesus was nowhere on the radar for me in that world. Um, but I did have, I, I did have like this desire in my heart to, to, to be a, at least what I thought was a good person, I guess, if you want to qualify it. Yeah. And then, um, going into my rookie year, I'm still very much so living the way I lived in college. And, and I was absolutely a partier. Um, you know, I had the, I had the selfishness of anybody. Um, I was a womanizer. I was a you know, partier. Um, uh, you know, I just had a very narrow vision of, you know, life and, and, you know, where I fit in it. So where's the moment take place when suddenly it just clicks when something happens and you're like, you know what, this thing is real, this Jesus, I need to follow him. When does that take place for you? Yeah, I was, a, I went on a pretty long process and journey. It probably, like I said, I always felt like I had this, I don't, I don't want to be like, I, you know, I don't know what the best categorization would it be of it would, would be, but I didn't want to be like a dirt bag, but I was, Yeah. and I didn't want to be a bad person, but I was. And so I always had this like kind of battle inside, you know, from when I can remember high school and college years. And then, you know, I'm in the NFL. And so I've, I've, I've completed this dream, right? I've reached the pinnacle. I've got, you know, a ton of money. I've got a ton of fame. I've got girls. I've got everything that I had thought my 14 year old self would want. And I would sit in my, my room or my house at times and be like, wait, I've got everything I want and everything that I've worked for and everything that I thought would be awesome. But this is as good as it gets. Like this is, this is the pinnacle because it doesn't feel like it. It just, do it didn't feel like this is as, as this is what I'm here for. This is the best it's going to get. I've got everything I want. I still felt empty. I still felt like there's got to be something better than this out there. And so, and like I said, I knew I was, I was becoming a man that I did not want to become. I did not want to become somebody who thought, um, thought of women a certain way, thought of myself as a certain way, could treat people this way, could treat people however I wanted, um, could do whatever I wanted. Uh, I didn't want to become the man, you know, that um, kind of lived by the world, you know? And so I knew I was becoming that person. And so that scared me to death because that was my biggest fear is was becoming, um, becoming the man that, you know, I grew up so often seeing, you know, in, in, in community, in the world, right? So there's a couple guys that my second year in the NFL come to our team as free agents. John Kitna is one of them. Josh McCown is one of them. Mike Furry is one of them. And um, obviously John Kitna and Josh McCown, immediate relationships get struck because we're in the same quarterback room. And pretty early on, you know, I watched those guys do everything. And I don't know why I did. I just did. And I remember thinking to myself, there's something different about these three dudes that is really, really cool. And whatever it is, you know, whatever they were doing or had or how they were getting it done, I wanted it because these guys were incredible dudes, awesome competitors, great workers. Um, but great family men and had great families and marriages. And I, you know, I had this 
perception that, wait, you can't really be a great dad and a great husband, but also be, you know, I like to reference like a dog on the football field. Like you can't be this fearless competitor and leader, but also like this sweet husband and caring and loving dad. And so I was like, how, why are they able to have both? And, you know, I, I just remember I got to figure it out what it is. I got to figure out what those guys have. And the more time I spent with them, you know, they all kind of went about their faith, their relationship with Jesus differently. John is very much so, you know, a, a bold, bold person when it comes to his faith and his relationship with Jesus. And he is very black and white with it. Jo- Josh is a little bit, um, you know, closer to Kitna and how he goes about his life. But Josh is has got this endearing quality to him that you just go, man, you're such a good dude. And then Mike Furry is so much an action, 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 doer, 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 doesn't talk a lot, but you know what he stands for because of what he does. And those three guys incorporated with our team chaplain, Dave Wilson, kind of just sparked this journey for me of figuring out, you know, what was going to be, you know, how I wanted to go about making sure that I didn't become the man that I was becoming. And so we went on a journey of those guys pouring into my life and one-on-one discipleship. And, you know, I also said to them, I don't want to become a Jesus follower or a Christian because again, I'm a white dude in America, you know, so I wanted to do a little bit of research of a lot of faiths, a lot of religions, because if I was going to you know, entertain making that the center of my life, I literally wanted to believe it. I didn't want to do it just because, you know, 80% of the country did. Hmm. That's interesting. So what was that journey like in, in the exploration? And then the moment when you, when you maybe told one of the guys, or you just said, you know what, God, it's you, it's you, Lord, yeah. it's you, Jesus. Yeah. Um, the journey was, was incredibly educational. Um, I'm a person who likes to, you know, I'm a skeptic at heart. So I'm a person who loves to try to find the ability to disprove something. That's just how I'm wired. So, you know, I spent a lot of one-on-one time with John Kitna and this would be, you know, John would literally have me over his house. I was, you know, not married. I was single and John would have me over his house at five o'clock in the morning before we would go into work and he would disciple me. And John was the type of guy that I could ask anything to. And if he didn't have the answer, he would get it. And then I spent a lot of time with Mike Furry and his family and just watching how he lived out this Jesus thing, right? This, this faith that he claimed to, he just lived it out. And then Dave Wilson, our team chaplain was the guy that I would go to and say, well, no, listen, I, uh, this Jesus thing, I've disproved it, you know, and he would be the guy that would sit back and laugh and, you know, okay, well, listen, read this or read that, or, Hey, how about you read this book or read this article? And so, you know, it was probably a year, year and a half journey of me going, you know, through this educational process, but also this emotional process and um, this soul searching process. And, I started to attend our Bible studies a little bit more and it was all this kind of the building up of this journey, right? I started stacking these blocks or people around me started stacking these blocks and Jesus was stacking these blocks in my life. And we were sitting, we were sitting on uh, September 23rd of 2006. It's a Saturday night before a game uh, at home in Detroit at Ford Field. We're about to play the Packers. And Dave Wilson, our team chaplain, and I can attest to this being a real thing in the middle of the chapel is like, listen, guys, I don't normally do this. This is really weird or random, but God's putting on my heart for, you know, for someone to have the opportunity to accept Jesus tonight. And I just want to take a break from teaching. It's on my heart. And I'm, I'm, this is the opportunity. I don't know why, but the spirit's telling me that someone in this room wants to accept Jesus. And Jason, I was that guy like sitting in the chair going, wait, <laughs> is he talking about me right now? You yeah. Know, to myself like, wait, this is super weird. So, um, you know, it, it, it had come upon my spirit, you know, just something. Literally, I felt like this physical nudge to go, yeah, it's you, you know, like this. 
literally this nudge in my gut. And so that night I prayed the prayer of salvation in the middle of chapel, you know, to myself and, um, you know, kind of whispered it under my voice, didn't tell anybody and, but, you know, accepted Jesus that night. And then the next morning, you know, pregame, I'm running around and, and, um, kind of doing what I thought was my normal routine. And Kitna came up to me and he gave me this look. He's like, did you accept Jesus last night? And I was like, what is going on right now? <laughs> um, and I was like, yeah, dude, I did. And we had this really cool moment of embrace because he was such a big, you know, part of my journey. And, and, um, you know, I was, you know, in that moment, I did a 180 in my life in that, in that exact night. Wow. That's an yeah. awesome story. I love that. And I think about, you know, my own journey and the people who were put in my life and, 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 and for you, it's, it's funny how football was in a way your God and then God used football to bring you closer to him. No, 100%. I mean, if, if listen, football was an awesome thing for me to be a part of. I absolutely loved it, but I look at the, the greatest thing that football brought me was the opportunity to see Jesus truly lived out in people's lives. And because I, that's when I, like, when I say, I don't know where I would be without football, I don't look at it as, you know, what I would be doing for my job or where I would be lifestyle wise. I look at it as, I truly believe that without football, I would have become the man that I was my biggest fear I didn't want to become. And I was just so, so fortunate and blessed to have football used as this avenue to get me to Jesus. But then you're still a football player. And so, yeah, you have this, this new change, this sort of renewing of your mind and your heart and your spirit but you're still a football player. So what does that look like for you now that you have this sort of newfound faith, but yet you still want to be competitive? Your, your, your two quarterbacks there, John Kitna and Josh McCown, are both believers and great supporters of you, but from the competitive football side, you're trying to beat them out. You're trying to become the starting quarterback. So how did you navigate all of that and maybe take us into as you've matured and grown older and – played many more years in the NFL, sort of how that faith came through in, in, in being a football player. Yeah. I mean, I think early on for me, it was a little bit difficult for me to navigate. Um, because again, uh, I, I thought like as this football player, I couldn't be a Christian. I couldn't be a Jesus follower, but also this vicious competitor. I couldn't, I couldn't. <laughs> yeah. you know, in my mind, I just couldn't, I had to go like be nice and kind and sweet and passive. And through more and more of me spending time in the word and spending time, you know, in the, in, in commun communication with a lot of these guys who had impact on my life, I realized truthfully, I should become even greater. I, I became an even greater competitor after I became a Christian. Um, I had even greater desire to go and be this ultimate, um, competitive, um, try as hard as I can guy, because, you know, Dave Wilson, our team chaplain in Detroit, again, would always reference, you know, truthfully, if you want to go find the Christians on the team, they should be easy to watch at practice because they should be the guys trying the hardest hmm. because you should be trying for something other than, you know, for the, I'm the hard work guy or for your teammates or even yourself, you should be going and working to glorify God. And so that was something that rang, you know, rang in my core, you know, was like, wait, I can still go be a, a leader and a great competitor and be this Jesus follower. And so I, you know, I, um, I had come to this point where I was going to work as hard as I could and prepare as hard as I could and go play as hard as I could. And I knew that if I did that, you know, I had this, I had this peace and that this trust that God was going to do what he wanted. And I had come to this point where I had these dreams and visions of me being a player and they were all these great dreams and I had great aspirations for myself and I had this great work ethic. 
So as long as I did that stuff and worked as hard as I could and kept God at the forefront, if it worked out, it was part of his plan. And if it didn't, I was at peace with it because I didn't, I, there means if I had a vision for myself to be great and God didn't have that happen, there must be something that he has for me that is greater. And that was a difficult thing for me to accept. But as I matured more and spent more time in my word, it was um, something that I came to totally, totally accept and appreciate. And so I was still able to be the football player and leader that I wanted to be. But my my um, my viewpoint of the locker room, my viewpoint of my quarterback room changed. You know, I I so much more wanted to be about our team and impacting our team rather than I just want to go have my career and make as much money as I can and, you know, think about myself. And so, um, you know, my impact became a big deal to me. The friendships and the relationships that I built became a big deal to me. Um, You know, hopefully helping younger guys coming in, finding their way, finding their self, you know, finding this, this dude named Jesus that I know um, became, became the paramount goal for my, you know, time in the NFL rather than, well, I want to be a starter or I want to, you know, make X amount of dollars. That was part of my NFL journey was, and and that's kind of one of the things that probably makes, you know, my, you know, uh, affinity to the locker room. So such a big deal to me was, you know, having those relationships and those impacts because that's, you know, how my life got kind of turned around. And your NFL journey, Dan Orlovsky, took you to a lot of different places. You talk about God's plan, right? Detroit, Houston, Indianapolis, Tampa, back to Troy, even a little bit of a stint in Los Angeles with the Rams this year in training camp. This NFL lifestyle is not your normal one, especially for somebody like you who's gone through, you know, many ups and downs in your career. How do you handle that as a player, just knowing that you might only be in a place for a year or two, the players that you're with this year, might be gone next year. Heck, you might be gone next year. That's just, uh, for me, that's a that's a, a weird thing. Like my wife is a comfortable person, you know, and I think as human beings, many of us are. We get settled in routines and we like our lives. But in the NFL, it literally is not for long. So how do you, how do you balance that? How do you handle that? It's hard. Like you said, it's not an easy life. And, I, you know, there's this perception out there that it is this glamorous thing, but you know, as you mentioned, you know, I, I had moved around a lot. I was fortunate enough to marry a girl who, you know, was all in and she, you know, she, where, wherever we go, we go as long as we're together type thing. But then, you know, we had kids. And so then that brings another variable into it. I mean, my kids up until this year, my kids have lived in my kids are I have five year old triplet boys and a two year old daughter. So our triplet boys have, you know, lived in six different homes already in five different cities and had been to four different schools. So, you know, there's a pro to that. There's a benefit to that, but there's also a lot of different negatives and cons to that. So, you know, there's a lot of challenges that come with it and there's a lot of great stuff to it, but there's a lot of challenges. So, you know, I was fortunate. My wife handled it so well, but it's a, it's a journey. And when you have a really good foundation of faith and, you know, a relationship with Jesus and a trust and a peace with God, it, it makes it easier because, you know, when it's a real thing to you, when it's real, you can go, okay, well, God's going to open the door that he wants open and shut the ones that he wants shut. And what, what the real challenge is, is for us to, you know, kind of listen and to be okay with it and to be obedient to it is, you know, I think a lot of guys, struggle with that in the NFL is when that NFL door gets shut, whether you believe in God or not, when that NFL door gets shut, a lot of guys go, no, 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 no. The door's not shut. And they just do this hang on thing. And then they're four years removed and go, well, who am I? And what am I? And what do I do now? Where I think when you get to that point where you truly trust, you know, a plan that is, you know, stood the test of time in God's word, when that door gets shut, you go, okay, well, the door got shut because you were the dude who opened the door. 
you hmm. know, you, the door was opened by you and now it's shut by you. And so you'll open a different door. And so, you know, I think when you get to that point of having that faith and that, that peace, it makes it easier. Not that it's easy, but it makes it easier to go from here and there to there because you got you, cause you know, okay, well, I'm going to just trust God. And if he opens up this door, cool. And if he doesn't, cool. And I'll know that something else is next. So there's a lot of variables that are hard to it, but you know, I think that, you know, I'm one of the, the, you know, the fortunate guys that had, you know, a piece about it because of my faith. Is that the hardest part about being a football player? What is the hardest part? Well, you know, just being honest about the NFL, there's a lot of parts about the NFL that make it difficult for players as people. And that's not set as a knock on the NFL, but you know, in my opinion, the hardest part is you take these kids who are from the ages of 20 to 23 and whatever their background is, you, their life takes a 180, you know, I mean, very, very few kids come from money. So you're going to take this kid and because they do, you know, basically they do entertainment, you give them this chunk of money but then you also expect them to have the responsibility of a grown, grown adult with it and yeah. live. And I think that, you know, if you're a 21 year old kid and you get given, not given, but you earn this half a million dollars. Well, you're not going to make the same decision at 21 that you would at 35 about it. No. And that's, it's just a difficult thing to navigate as you come again, you go from hanging out in your college dorm and playing FIFA and, you know, eating, you know, uh, cheeseburgers at your school cafeteria to, okay, well, let, let's go eat at Morton's tonight and our bill's a $1,000. Well, it doesn't matter because I'm making a ton of money. And then I'm going to go buy this car because, wait, wait, this guy plays the same position as me, but he's he's driving a Porsche. Well, a lot of guys don't think, look at us. Well, he's played for 10 years. And so he's accrued a lot more value. So I think there's just a lot of things that go, man, you know, there's got to be a better way to handle the finances for these young players come in and educate them instead of, you know, you know, the 30 minute um, financial responsibility teaching seminar for the NFL players isn't enough. And so there's, I think that that's the hardest part is guys come into the NFL, they fall into this lifestyle and they think that that lifestyle is just going to always be there. And there's, there's this, you can fool yourself mentally. And so guys just become engulfed by this lifestyle. I mean, I mean, engulfed by this lifestyle where it totally changes who they are. And I think that's the hardest part is, you know, you become, you become, you fool yourself into thinking you're somebody that you're not. Hmm. I want to talk about the dynamics of a backup quarterback for you. Um, obviously, you know, as a quarterback in the NFL, you want to play, you want to compete and certainly earlier in your career, you're, you're, you're trying to do that. But at some point, you're probably labeled or you probably realize that your NFL career, at least from this time forward, maybe I'm wrong here, so correct me, is as a backup quarterback. So I wonder for you, Dan, you know, you backed up some pretty good quarterbacks and you played a long time. So you have a good career. But what, what is it? What do you think of that sort of label, I guess we'll call it, of being sort of a career backup and what that was like for you in your evolution as a player from the time you first got there, certainly until you retired recently last month. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I definitely early on had visions and dreams and aspirations and beliefs that I could start in the NFL, probably within my first, I want to say six years, you know, I, I, I always had like, Oh, I can start. And then when I did start some games, I played pretty well. So that just adds to that. Like, okay, I belong, you know, I can yeah. play, I can start. I think what happens as you're around the NFL longer and you have a longer career is, and I think this is such a good skill that I learned because of football, but you've got to be really honest about yourself and really honest about the situation. And as I got into my career later, I had to look at myself and say, okay, do I really think that I'm one of the best, you know, I don't, 
know if there's 32 quarter starting quarterbacks in the NFL. There's probably mid twenties, right. That are truly starters or 20 starters. So sure. I had to ask myself, am I one of the 20 best people in the world at this? And my, if I had, if, you know, I had to answer it honestly. And I said, I'm not, and that's okay. But am I one of the best 60 in the world at this? And my answer was yes. And so then the goal goes, or the, your, your vision or your, your, your uh, process, your journey goes to, okay, well, if, if I'm not one of the best 20, how do I continue to be one of the best 60? And so that's when, um, you know, it became so important for me to understand my role and to get really, 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 really good at my role and my role is to go and be the backup quarterback. So how was I going to go be the best backup quarterback that I could be? And I had to go and, and learn a little bit more about some other positions because as the backup, the more value that you bring to the team, the, 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 the longer you play, the more that you are valued. And so I had to make sure that my relationship with the starting quarterback was the most relationship, most important relationship I had on the football team, because as the, as the backup, you know, it was a big deal to me that the starter knew that one, I wasn't after his job and that didn't change the competitor in me. I, I just wasn't after his job. I wasn't there to undermine him Two, I always had his back, no matter what, no matter if I thought he was right or wrong, I always had his back and three, that he could always trust me. Always. And so that was important for me to, and it was real to me too. It wasn't this character that I played. It was, that was really important to me. And so those became kind of like the, the pillars, so to say of, you know, kind of my career was, you know, those variables. And I think the greatest thing that I did was accept that role because I loved that role. Do I wish I played more? Sure. Because I'm a competitor, but I also sit back and I go, well, I gave everything I had to the game. And as a person who, you know, truly believes that God's got this journey for us to be on, this plan for us to be on, I think it was one of those times when God closed the door, but opened another one. And he opened that backup job for me for the last six years of my career. And, you know, this is said in not a, a bragging way, but I know that I had impact on those guys that I shared rooms with and shared locker rooms with. I know I did because of the communication I've had with them. And that's a super rewarding feeling to know that, um, you know, I accepted that role. It became important to me. And then, you know, I, I kind of, you know, was, was really good at it. So to say, is that why you see, a lot of backup quarterbacks when they play turn into coaches because they sort of had to have a coaching mentality with the starter. Yeah, I think so. You know, like you, you as a backup quarterback, you are in, in a lot of ways, if you're smart and good at it and have a good demeanor about yourself, you are a coach because, you know, I started telling young guys this, you know, when you're in the backup role, there's 16 games a year in the NFL. And as the backup, if you don't play, you've wasted 16 games that year of being able to help your team. So you have to get into that mindset of, okay, I'm going to be ready to play, but if I don't play, I don't want to just be a guy who hangs out, uses the facility, practices here and there and cashes my checks. What can my impact be? And so that's helping the starter prepare. That's helping the starter in game. That's helping the number three receiver understand coverage is a little bit better. So his routes will be a little bit more defined for the quarterback. That's helping the coaches on game day. Hey, I'm seeing this. That's helping the offensive line. If you know a defensive line coach or a defensive lineman and go, Hey, I know that if you guys you know, use a hard count a bunch this week, that this team is coached to jump off sides because they don't care about the five yard flag stuff. So there's all those variables that you have to um, take in. And I think that's why a lot of guys can, can tra just transition to coaching well, because it's kind of what they've been doing. So what now you, you retired, you were in training camp with the Rams this year in August and there for a few weeks, they released you right before the season started. And then you retired in October, husband, 
father, like you said, of four kids, five-year-old triplet boys. I can't imagine the joy that must be. And, and certainly being a dad to a daughter, I can relate. So what's next for you? What's next for Dan Orlovsky? Yeah, I mean, I'm really, really enjoying being home. And like I said at the beginning, doing some things in fall that I've never done. I've never played fall golf. I've got to be able to do that. Hmm. I get to drop my kids off at school every day, which is cool, and get to pick them up if I want. Um, I've been able to spend some time with some friends and family that I've never had the chance to spend with. I've had the opportunity to go to tailgate at a couple football games, which has been fun and something, again, I've never done. Um, and some, some of the holiday stuff I'm looking forward to. So I'm, I'm enjoying being home, but I'm a worker. Um, and I, uh, it's important for me to work. And, uh, you know, my wife has said this to me numerous times over the past, you know, couple months, you know, that, you know, I kind of have this, this skill or this gift when it comes to football, whether it's communicating it or breaking it down or analyzing it or coaching it. And she's like, don't, just throw away this gift because, you know, uh, you, you think that football is over for you. And that's been big for me for her to say that stuff. So I would love to get into broadcasting and commentating because I've really enjoyed, you know, kind of communicating the game of football to, you know, the, the everyday fan. I think I have a unique perspective. I can see me coaching. Um, I think there's a, you know, there, there's a, an impact that can be had there that is kind of hard to be matched. And, and I've had some opportunities to go do that already this season. And I've kind of said, thank you, but no, thank you right now, because I wanted to take the time and do some stuff with my family, but uh, I'll see what's next. I, I think the, you know, the thing that I'll try and do first is, is get into, you know, a TV broadcasting world, because I think that's where, you know, this gift that I have can kind of be shared. That's cool. We always ask uh, our guests one final question on the podcast, Dan Orlowski, and we appreciate you being here. And it's not always an easy answer. It's an easy question, but it's not always an easy, an easy answer. So for you, what has the Lord been teaching you right now? You've been retired a couple months. What have you learned from the Lord over these last few months? Oh, countless stuff. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, I think that for me, like I said, I'm kind of a skeptic at heart. So I, I'm always on this journey of God kind of reminding me, like, I'm on the throne, I'm on the throne, I'm on the throne. So I think that's always going to be a part of my journey is God continuously reminding me about that stuff. Uh, I think I've had this recalibration of, you know, kind of going back to when I was a kid and I referenced it a bunch, you know, kind of in this podcast was I had this dream or this thing in my this this vision in my heart and I really wanted to do everything I could to get really 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 good at it and I think that what is what God is kind of teaching me right now is he's kind of put this dream or this vision back in my heart and he wants me to get really 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 good at it and I think that um you know it's it's this process of retrusting God and re Re remembering again that God is on this throne and he's placing these things in my heart for a reason. And I just, again, I, I need to, you know, trust in it or being obedient. You hear people say that is be obedient in it, and obedient in it and going, okay, well, if you're going to go open this door, it's my job to, you know, kind of follow it and trust it because, you know, what God has kind of taught me is he hasn't let me down. You know, he, he hasn't ever turned his back, but I also, you know, one of the things that, and I wrestle with this a little bit and you'll, you'll kind of probably laugh at it, but mm. I think what he's, what he's taught me is, or, or brought to my eyes is that it's important to him that my communication to people is in so much of a different level than me as a football player. You know, I think that it's important for me to, make sure that I see myself and that other people see myself as, you know, um, you know, I'm a husband and a dad and a friend and a brother and a son and, and to, to make sure that I'm still cultivating those relationships because 
Um, they're easy when you're a, a, a celebrity, I guess, if you want to say it. They're easy when you're a pro football player because everyone wants those relationships with a pro football player. They change once you're no longer a pro football player. But it's, I, I think God's put it on my heart to make sure that those people get to know me a little bit more than me as just the football player. And so, and, and those are my, some of my best friends, you know, because our relationships will now change because I'm no longer the pro football player. So I think God's kind of put it on my heart to make sure that, you know, those relationships, you, you, you know, are, are taken to the, the next level outside of, well, this is Dan, my best friend, he plays for the lions. So that makes complete sense. He is Dan Orlovsky, former NFL quarterback now, seven seasons in the Motor City, he played in Houston and Indianapolis and Tampa Bay and finished up with the Rams, certainly with UConn. And uh, we do appreciate you, Dan, being on the podcast, appreciate your stories and your openness about your faith and your struggles and just wish you nothing but the best, my friend, and, and uh, excited to see what God has in store for you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, bud. And we do thank Dan Orlovsky, former NFL quarterback, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You can reach Dan on Twitter. He's at Dan Orlovsky 7, the number 7, Dan Orlovsky 7. As always, you can reach us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum. We're also on Facebook and Instagram and, of course, our YouTube page, which has all of our podcasts archived there. And you can reach me directly on Twitter at Jason Romano or email me, Jason at Sports Spectrum dot com jason at sports spectrum.com would love to hear from you love to hear your feedback love to hear your guest ideas guest suggestions story suggestions it doesn't have to be for the podcast it could be something that we write uh, for sports spectrum.com or write for our magazine so please email us let us know what you think of the podcast and any guest ideas you might have thank you so much for joining us and listening in on today's podcast and we will see you next time right here on sports spectrum have a great day everybody 